episode of Extreme Peril. We had 30 second warning to get out. The next thing I knew is I had to turn around and run. It was at that moment I knew that we were going to die. I can hear somebody out my bedroom window screaming for help. I don't want him to die. I want to get down. I can't. When I saw the towers, I uh, thought, oh God. Hit the tower. I heard this loud thunderous roar. But before I knew it, the roof was on top of us. As I got closer and closer, the roar of the water was so loud. It was practically deafening. The next thing I knew is I had to turn around and run. It reduced this island to rubble. Like, it looked like it had been hit by a nuclear bomb. It was at that moment I knew that we were going to die. There was no question in my mind that we were dead. On December 26th, 2004, at 7.58 a.m., a massive undersea earthquake rattles the Earth's crust 160 miles off the western coast of the Indonesian island of Sumatra. It is the third largest earthquake ever recorded. 450 miles north of the Kokokau Island Resort in Thailand, Californian Sandy Thompson feels the tremble. I remember I was in bed reading and I felt it and it was nothing to me. It was just a minimal earthquake. But this earthquake unleashes a catastrophic tsunami that quickly radiates across the Indian Ocean. Tens of thousands of people in vulnerable coastal communities have no idea that killer waves are thundering toward them at speeds of up to 500 miles per hour. So each time there's an earthquake happening close enough to the seafloor that there's displacement of water, there will be a so-called tsunami. Might not cause any damage, but there will be something. But this earthquake, registering magnitude 9.2 on the Richter scale, is a monster wave-making machine. It occurs at a seam in the Earth's crust known as a subduction zone, where one tectonic plate plunges beneath another. In this case, the fault between the India and Burma plates snaps and shifts more than 65 feet. This combination of vertical and horizontal jolts to the seabed displaces billions of tons of water and generates deadly tsunami waves, crossing the ocean at hundreds of miles per hour. Just minutes after the earthquake, on a tiny island off the coast of Thailand, Sandy Thompson and her boyfriend Dave are enjoying another day in paradise. We arrived at the beach at about 9 o'clock in the morning and it was beautiful. It was picture perfect. Just the water was like glass. It was just like a postcard. But then the picture perfect view changes to something she's never seen before. Across the horizon there was a, a white line. It looked exactly like a wake that a, a boat would leave, except it spanned across, as far as you could see, across the horizon. And then I turned around and looked behind me, and I saw all of the locals had stopped working, and they were standing on the embankment, and they were pointing. That's when I said to Dave, I think we better get out of the water. 60 miles south on a beach in southern Phuket, Thailand, Jim Seferati and Annette Bergsland are eating breakfast in a seaside cafe. They suddenly notice something incredibly strange. The water was receding to the point where boats were on the sand where actually people were seeing fish flopping around. Um, so that's when we started to realize it was something uh, that nobody had seen before. Many curious people, Thai as well as tourists, walk out onto the seabed to look at the fish. It is exactly the wrong thing to do. If the sea retreats, it will come back for sure. So that's, that's a definitive sign that there will be an inundation coming after. 
as the earthquake causes the leading edge of the Burma plate to rise 12 to 15 feet, the area behind it actually sinks. This drains water away from the coastline, but only temporarily. The overwhelming wave energy coming from the source of the tsunami soon prevails. It sends all that water and much more back to the beaches. And it arrives with a vengeance. The water started coming in drastically quickly and actually pushed the people that I was running towards to the right of the beach. And it was a heavy wave and it pushed them to the point where the next thing I knew is I had to turn around and run. But it isn't possible to outrun a tsunami. Even when it hits land, the wave travels at speeds of 20 miles per hour or faster. The only thing I remember is turning around and a wave hitting me and pushing me literally 200 feet up the beach over a break wall. And I never felt the break wall, which is about five feet high. So I was pushed up that break wall. My legs are shaking like crazy. And I see my girlfriend in the corner of two buildings, screaming. In the minutes that follow, several more deadly waves inundate the coast. Get in, get in, get in. If Jim, his girlfriend, and other survivors don't get to higher ground soon, they will drown. As I got closer and closer, there was this incredible sound that came with it. It just sounded like jet engines. From a six-foot-high embankment on the beach at Kokokau, Sandy Thompson videotapes the tsunami as it thunders towards several boats full of tourists. We watched those boats just get pummeled into toothpicks. We had 30 second warning to get out and then I started to run. I turn around to see what's coming and when I saw the impact of that water hit the resort, it was at that moment I knew that we were gonna die. There was no question in my mind that we were dead. Sandy makes it to a flatbed truck across a field, the highest object she can see. And within seconds, it's surrounded by water. We watched the whole resort underwater. We watched everything coming, mattresses, televisions, people just floating by. And I knew that people were dying. And I also knew it wasn't over. These secondary waves that come way later than the main wave can locally produce more damages on long after the, the first wave. The second wave of this tsunami hits Thailand less than an hour after the first one. This one-two punch turns this vacation paradise into a grim wasteland of devastation and tragedy. After barely surviving the tsunami during a diving expedition off the coast of Thailand, Faye Walks and Eugene Kim return to the ruins of their island resort. It just reduced this island to rubble. It ripped apart almost every building. It opened up the septic tanks. I mean, it looked like it had been hit by a nuclear bomb. A lot of people who had been on the island had died. They drowned. So we spent the next four hours floating around um, among the debris, identifying uh, bodies that were being washed out to sea, and then bringing them back. When the couple finally gets on shore, they find their bungalow reduced to rubble. With no place to go and their possessions gone, Eugene and Faye join the hunt for victims. Those images will stay with me forever. Eugene, Faye, Sandy, Dave, Jim, and Annette all survive. But with so many dead, they also know they were incredibly lucky. It was young people, old people, couples, families, people from Thailand, people from the US, people from Norway, Sweden, and 200 and some other thousand people didn't live through it. Don't let me drown. Don't let me die.
die. Please save me. It was devastating to hear him screaming like that and not be able to get right to him. I don't want him to die. I want to get the hell I can. Weymouth, Massachusetts, January 2008. John Volta and his nephew, Steve Santisuoso, are up late playing video games in this Boston suburb. They have no idea that just a few feet from John's backyard, someone is fighting for his life in the icy waters of Whitman's Pond. I broke from the action to get a drink. While pouring my drink out in the kitchen, I heard someone screaming from outside. someone, just a shadow of him, frailing around below the water line. John and Stephen run out to help. Although neither knows it, the man in the water is 27-year-old Jason Du Bois, John's longtime neighbor and a childhood friend of Stephen's. It was very dark. We couldn't even see where he was at first. Help! He was upset, yelling, asking people to help him. He didn't want to die. Help! The ice that covers Whitman's pond cracks open under Jason, even though it's the middle of winter and the temperature at 2 a.m. is in the low 20s. Safety guidelines say that ice, a foot or more thick, can support a medium-sized truck. But as ice on a body of water like Whitman's pond gets thinner, it becomes much weaker. If it's two inches thick or less, people shouldn't even try to walk on it. Going through the ice is one of the most frightening experiences you'll ever have. When you first go in cold water, plunge through the ice, there is a gasp reflex, and you gasp repeatedly. If you went through the ice and went underwater and that gasp reflex occurs, you, you're going to drown. Somebody, please! Somebody! I could hear him saying, don't let me drown, don't let me die, please save me. And I'm telling you, it just goes right through you. John and Stephen grab a long extension cord and race to the edge of the ice. We tried to toss it to him, but Jason's hands were so cold that he couldn't grab it. It just kept sliding through him. Jason's fingers can't grab the cord because his body is reacting to the frigid water. He's beginning to suffer the debilitating effects of hypothermia. We cool 26 times faster in water than we do in air at the same temperature. So when you're wet or immersed in water, you're going to cool very fast. The body is trying to conserve its heat in the core, so it shuts off blood flow, shuts off your radiators in your extremities to keep the heat in your core. John desperately searches the shoreline for anything that could help save Jason. Then he sees a canoe. We picked up the canoe, we dragged it to the shoreline. I pushed it as far as I could and it made it probably about 20 feet to Jason, but he still needed to go a little further. And at that moment, the firemen had pulled up. The first rescuers on the scene are firefighters Tom McGrath and Tom Ballou. Because they've come in a ladder truck, they don't have the right equipment for an ice rescue. No one knew at that point how long he had been in. We had to get in there and get him fast and get him out. Lieutenant McGrath decides to improvise. He puts on a dry suit, ties a rope to it, and asks the police officer on shore to hold the other end. My intention was to crawl out on the ice and slide into the same hole that the victim fell through. So I'm crawling out, heading for the victim, heading for a voice, and then I fall through, and that changes the dynamics of everything. The surface breaks under McGrath because Jason's accident has destabilized the surrounding ice layer. When he went through the ice, he didn't walk off the edge of an ice sheet. He went through the ice, so there are large slabs of ice floating around him. And that's why the rescuers couldn't get to him. At that point, I say to myself, this kid's going to die if I don't get there. Get Breaking ice little by little. And it's just not moving. And I'm thinking, what's the backup plan? As Lieutenant McGrath struggles on the ice, John and Stephen try again to push the canoe across the ice to Jason. I told Steve, you light it at me, lay on your belly, and give it one more push. I got up to a knee with one hand and just shot the canoe. I aimed it right at him, and I was maybe about 30, 25 yards away, and just pushed it. 
canoe stops short of Jason. But McGrath decides that if he can get to it, it could be a lifeline for Jason. I made my way to the canoe and said, this is my backup plan right now. I've got nothing else. So I'm going to hold the back of the canoe, try to break the ice and push. And that's what I'm trying to do, heading for a voice, yelling for help. Firefighter Blue all of a sudden shows up on my right. I said, get in the canoe, get in the front, and I'll push. Tommy started breaking ice, he's bouncing the canoe up and down. And I'm swimming from the back, just pushing and pushing and kicking and pushing. While that's happening, I'm swimming, the rope wraps around my legs, which in effect makes the rope shorter. We're screaming, I need more rope. I'm trying to get untangled. We're just trying to get out there. Slow going. We're not getting there, and this is just a bad feeling. But I just, I don't want him to die. I want to get there, and I can't. 2 a.m., January 2008, in Weymouth, Massachusetts. Rescuers struggle to save a man who's about to drown after he falls through the ice on Whitman's Pond. I'm breaking ice little by little, and it's just not moving. I don't want him to die. I want to get there, and I can't. As McGrath and Ballou continue to battle the ice, firefighters Jim Shea and Anthony Diotto carefully make their way across the ice to help. Despite the efforts of all four firefighters, the rock-hard ice is not giving way. We were using our fists to smash the, uh, the ice, forearms, fists, anything that really did the job. And with each passing moment, Jason's chances are dwindling. And I felt helpless. I felt like we were in the same spot for 20 minutes trying to get to him. As the firefighters inch their way toward Jason, it's obvious he can't hang on much longer. He started actually going under the water a few times. We were just trying to get to him as fast as we could so it wouldn't turn into a recovery. As you're cooling off, you're going to lose some of your reasoning ability. Things get muddled. You get very sleepy, very tired. The ability for your brain to tell your hands or your arms to do something trails off pretty fast. Rescuers realize that they can't wait any longer, and firefighter Baloo jumps into the frigid water. We were just screaming, trying to reassure him that we're almost there, you're going to make it, keep fighting. finally got there. It's over. But then it's not over. We gotta get him back in the canoe and get to shore. The first time we tried to get the victim in the boat, uh, there was no one to anchor the back side of the boat. Yeah. Lieutenant McGrath jumped in the back side of the boat to stabilize it more. And then from there we did it another time and it worked out great. Jason in the canoe is just wiped out and say anything. Just Exhausted. Even with Jason safely inside the canoe, there's one last hurdle to negotiate. Firefighter Shea started yelling, pull, pull. Pull him! Pull him! But the way the ropes were wrapped around my leg, if they pulled, I would have ended up going leg first. Hold on! His leg was tangled in the rope, so I actually helped him untangle. Hold on! And then we got pulled in. It wasn't really a 
sigh of relief until, until we shut those ambulance doors and sent him on his way. While walking home from a friend's house, Jason takes a shortcut across a frozen pond and crashes through the ice. Amazingly, despite being in the frigid water for almost 30 minutes, Jason suffers only a mild case of hypothermia. I was in shock, but I fell through. I started swinging, moving my arms around, trying to find where I was. Help! Help! Yeah, I was freaking out. I was just trying to keep afloat until someone hurt me. Help! I just kept on fighting for my life. And his rescuers certainly know how lucky he is. The odds of someone being in that cold of water for as long as he was, not good. It was a great feeling getting there and getting him. Because uh, it would have been tough to live with if he didn't make it. It was a scary night. A scary night. Yeah, it's now to stay away from the ice. You know, I don't want you to replay on that again. Jason was in the water probably for about 20 minutes. That's a long time to be in water that cold. I think he's very lucky. We do training, ice rescue training every year. And that would have felt horrible if that training hadn't paid off and we actually lost someone. I think about it a lot. Every time I look out the pond, you know, it crosses my mind. I have fallen in before myself when I was like, about eight or nine years old. So I know how scary it is. This time, you know, it was my turn to help somebody get out. That night was just supposed to be a nice quiet night at home, and it turned out to be a dramatic rescue on ice, on thin ice. I think it's a miracle Jason is alive today. for dear life. October 10th, 2004. Another perfect day at the Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta. An annual event that draws thousands of visitors to New Mexico. One of the biggest crowd pleasers is the Smoky Bear Balloon. Smoky Bear is a large balloon. It is about 100 feet tall and 72 feet across at the brim, and it weighs a little over 1,100 pounds. Creating enough hot air inside the balloon to lift all that weight off the ground takes two separate propane burners. At full power, these burners can produce up to 60 million BTUs of energy per hour, equal to the combined heat output of 600 home furnaces. Just after 7 a.m., Bill is at the controls as the Smoky Bear balloon lifts off in the Fiesta's mass ascension. Riding in the basket with Bill are two young passengers, 10-year-old Aaron Whitaker and 14-year-old Troy Wells. I had never gone up in a balloon. This was my first opportunity. The weather is perfect for ballooning, clear skies and calm winds. The winds were less than five miles an hour, and that's what they predicted the weather to be all morning. The trip was going real smooth. I was enjoying myself. Everything was completely normal. I had decided it was a good time to start looking for a landing spot. But as Bill prepares to take the enormous balloon back to Earth, he suddenly faced with a balloonist's worst nightmare. The balloon radically shook, turned in a sudden 90 degree direction. An unexpectedly strong wind takes control of the balloon and sends it straight towards a 640 foot tall radio tower. When I saw the towers, I thought, oh God, 
that was directly in our path. The balloon is caught in a vertical wind shear in which wind speed and direction abruptly change at different altitudes. This happens so quickly that Bill has little time to react. First thing a pilot does with the balloon in that situation is look for a place to land. Well, in that area, we were over homes and roads and power lines and guy wires to those towers. And my only alternative, I decided, was to try to burn to rise above them. Bill opens the two burners to maximum output. If it works, the rising temperature inside the balloon will lift it up and over the tower. We kept burning and burning and burning and really virtually not getting anywhere. It was obvious that, you know, things were going wrong. We all got down on the bottom of the basket and held on for dear life. It's smoky out there. Oh, oh, it hit, it hit the tower. The sound of the balloon tearing itself apart was like a scream I've never heard before. High winds wrap the balloon's shredded canopy around the tower, suspending the basket and its three occupants 600 feet above the ground. You lose your sense of direction, like, almost immediately. You're moving so fast, there's so much shaking and spinning, and you can't tell what's happening. I actually thought we were falling. I pretty much, I knew I was going to die. Horrified spectators watch from the ground, powerless to help Bill and his two young passengers. We didn't know what would happen. One possibility was the tower could collapse, which would have been catastrophic. Another possibility was the basket could have uh, severed uh, the cables from the envelope and it could have fallen to the ground. I was very, very... very concerned. Bill, who's a retired ranger for the U.S. Forest Service, acts fast to stabilize the basket. It's twisting in the wind and threatening to toss both him and the two boys to their deaths. When I managed to get it stabilized against the tower, we realized we had to get out of that basket. October 10, 2004, near Albuquerque, New Mexico. A hot air balloon crashes into the top of a 640-foot tall radio tower. The crash strands two young boys and the pilot in the balloon basket as gusty winds threaten to send them plummeting to the ground. When I managed to get it stabilized against the tower, we realized we had to get out of that basket. Aaron did not want to get onto the tower. He was crying. He wouldn't listen. Me and Bill were telling him to get onto the tower, and he wouldn't. But I just screamed at him and told him, Aaron, if you don't get onto the tower, you're going to die. And he kind of, like, after I said that, he just stopped crying and got onto the tower. I was up against the tower, holding it sort of with my back to them, and they clammed up over my right shoulder, right arm, and right shoulder, and head into the tower, one after the other. As soon as we got into the tower, we noticed that there was a ladder inside of it. It was about a foot wide and really thin and everything, and we could have easily slipped off. I was scared, frankly. When I realized that I had to, nobody to help me virtually, the boys had already begun their downward hike, then I had to figure out how am I going to do this. Bill's ingenious solution is to use his belt to secure the basket to the tower. And I wrapped the belt around it and then fastened the belt buckle to the tower. Then when I got out into the tower, it's like they're climbing down in the inside of it. Yeah, there's three of them. But now they face a new danger. The high winds are turning the balloon's canopy into a sail, and it's causing the tower to sway back and forth. You can look straight down from in the tower and see the ground one second, and then you couldn't see it the next, just because the uh, tower was bending so much. The winds threaten to collapse the tower, and the tower's guide wires make an aerial rescue impossible. 
The trio's only way off the tower is a risky climb down the narrow maintenance ladder. The climb down the tower seemed like a very, very long time. One of the worries I had, what kind of power was circulating in this tower. The tower belongs to a 50,000 watt AM radio station in Albuquerque. Station engineers have turned off the transmitter, but Bill and the two boys are still at risk. Because of the static electricity that builds up on a tower like that, that for you to try to jump off the tower and go to ground, you'll probably be electrocuted. So they use a cherry picker to actually take you off the side of the tower. And of course, the cherry picker is insulated. Linemen reach them 100 feet up the tower and get them safely off. Just over an hour after the Smoky Bear balloon crashes into the tower, the boys and their pilot finally reach solid ground. So happy to see you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> His first balloon ride, huh? The tough yeah, the worst down. balloon ride. You're gonna, oh. You did good. You did good. <laughs> yeah, it is going to be the last one. The moment that my feet got on the ground, that's when it all kicked in. I almost immediately started shaking, felt weak. The uh, paramedics said that I was pale. The fear actually kicked in as soon as I got on the ground and I was actually safe. When you're actually faced with death, then you're put in a situation where you most likely, you know, will die. It just kind of changes you, and it, it changed me. It made me appreciate my life a lot more. Things could have been so much more worse. They just could have been terrible. And as a result, we're still here talking about it. And Bill Chapel and I still get together and have a good time. <laughs> So, yeah, I think that uh, quite possibly Bill, uh, I don't know if he had luck on his side that day or if the, uh, the angels were looking out for him, but uh, everything turned out well. I'm glad. I uh, would like to forget it, but if anyone can grow from it, anybody can understand a little better what happened, if somehow possibly it could be avoided, then it's, it's worth it to me. I just hope that, that nothing like this ever, ever occurs, ever happens again. They just picked him off the tower with the cherry picker and he looks fine. All he keeps doing is looking up at his balloon. I can tell you, honey, it's retired. Even so, Clark carefully analyzes what caused the potentially fatal accident. When Smokey goes through a wind shear, you have two different forces acting on the balloon. One blowing in one direction, one blowing the other, and typically they're blowing at different speeds. Because Smokey has ears, the brim of a hat, and a very large nose, it can cause the balloon to spin. How the hell are you? Good. Good to see you. Since the accident, Troy has gone for many balloon rides with Bill. But Aaron refuses to get into another balloon. My crew assured me and the agencies with whom we work, we can build another balloon. Don't worry, we can build another balloon. And we did. And I heard this loud, thunderous roar and then started to look up. I knew it. The roof was on top of us. We could hear them calling for help, basically saying, we're here, we're here, we need help. I'm not going to survive this. What are the chances? Two oh six a.m. on July 4th, 2002, in Gloucester City, New Jersey. A three-story duplex catches on fire, and three little girls are trapped inside the building. When you hear there's children inside, you think of the life hazard, that they are in all likelihood helpless, they can't fend for themselves. It's completely up to you as a firefighter to remove them from the structure. The house on the right side, the exterior was fully involved. There was heavy fire on the first floor. I can see fire bombing in the second floor. 
On the night of the fire, Bob Williams is a lieutenant with the Gloucester City Fire Department. He and his men can't enter the side of the building where the girls are trapped. The fire is too intense. The firefighter's only choice is to try to find a way in from the other side. The 1899 structure, known locally as a twin, stands three stories tall and is divided into two side-by-side -side units. Like many of the older homes in the neighborhood, it is built with balloon framing, which leaves open spaces between the wall studs from one floor to another. This absence of fire stops between floors allows smoke, cinders, and flames to advance undetected through the building. We picked up the hose line and began to uh, enter the building. We went directly to the second floor uh, where we began our primary search. The smoke condition upstairs was banked just about to the floor area. Visibility was maybe three, four inches, uh, if that half a foot at the floor level. The conditions on the north side of the duplex are so bad that Bob and others get orders to evacuate for their own safety. After a few minutes outside, commanders agree they can't give up on the girls. Bob and a deputy chief lead firefighters back inside for one more search. We got to the second floor landing. Uh, we had a lot of fire now visible coming through the rear bedroom area and the hallway area. We could hear next door things starting to fall over there, uh, like wood breaking, cracking, and so forth. Bob and the deputy chief quickly order everyone out of the building, but it's too late. And I heard this loud, thunderous roar and started to look up. Before I knew it, the roof was on top of us. I got the collapse oh, man, and I think there were guys inside. Coming down the stairs, I felt a large area that come in and basically hit me at the waist level and at the knee level and knocked me down onto the stairs. And at that point I was I was hit from above and actually knocked head first through the railing. I was pinned on the stairwell hanging upside down over the edge of the stairwell. Firefighter Anthony Stagliano from the neighboring Mount Ephraim Fire Department joins a rescue team at the front of the smoldering pile. Uh, when we originally heard voices, we worked our way in from the front corner of the structure, and we were able to tunnel a way in. Anthony and the other rescuers call out to anyone who's still alive. The only voices that respond are those of several of the trapped firefighters. We could hear them calling for help, basically saying, we're here, we're here, we need help. Dozens of firefighters begin to break through the burning debris with chainsaws, axes, even their bare hands. Rescuers tunneling toward the voices soon locate two of the eight firefighters. They're trapped in the ruins of what used to be the living room on the duplex's north side. In the case of a collapse, you're always looking for the void space and hoping there are void spaces. And in this case, the void space where two of the firefighters uh, were found laying was their lifesaver. I'm waking up and I'm looking at this ceiling that's on top of me. It's right in front of my face. And I know I can't move, I can't wiggle. We started screaming and yelling just for anybody to hear us on the outside to know that, you know, we were still alive inside the rubble. Firefighters Mark Campanell and William Bates are standing in the living room when the building falls on top of them. They survived the initial collapse because the living room furniture, the sofa, the television, and other items stops the ceiling from falling completely to the floor. This creates a two and a half foot tall void space that gives them barely enough room to breathe. It's incredibly scary to be in a situation like that because it's the one thing, other than running out of air, that you think of as a farm you'd never want to have happen to. Firefighters are still trying to find the little girls, but now they also have to rescue eight of their own. very smoky in there, and the heat was building up. My legs were starting to burn. We had fire that was consuming the debris pile on top of the firefighters, and we had no other choice but to go in service with large stream appliances to knock down that fire. 
Hundreds of gallons of water rain down on the pile. The fire retreats, but all that water creates a new threat for the trapped firefighters. It filled the water up to my chin uh, and then on the side of my face. And at that point, uh, I was just screaming to, uh, to our battalion chief, uh, Stad Viano, who was, who was outside, to drill some holes so we wouldn't drown. The other firefighter was face down into the floor without an air mask and almost literally drowned in the water that was basically putting fire out and saving his life. Rescuers drill holes in the floor from below to drain the water while the crew tunneling into the living room works to stabilize the shifting debris. As we started working our way into the debris pile, we called for airbags and other equipment to stabilize some cribbing, to stabilize the debris as piles we walked in so it wouldn't collapse any further. Rescuers inflate Kevlar encased airbags to move the tons of smoldering debris just inches at a time. Then the crew braces the debris with blocks of wood called cribs. By carefully repeating these two processes multiple times, rescuers create a small tunnel that enables them to move closer to the trapped firefighters. The process was extremely slow. We had no idea how slow it was because the adrenaline is pumping. You're trying to work as quickly, though as safely as possible. While firefighters Mark, William, and Bob wait for rescuers to reach them, they realize they have not heard anything from the men who were standing near them when the building collapsed. I was calling out uh, for Firefighter Cantlin and Chief Sylvester uh, and not hearing them respond and knowing that it was just the three of us that, that were in that pocket. It was, uh, it was very scary to, uh, to think the worst had happened to them. During that period, I thought this may be it. I'm young, I'm here out of high school, and I'm not going to get a chance to do anything. You know, I'm not going to survive this. What's the, what's the, what are the chances? Finally, two hours after the collapse, the last of five surviving firefighters is pulled from the debris. I was the last one, the last firefighter to be, to be pulled out from the rubble. They pulled me out first because I was on top of them. They drug me out through the tunnel, passed me through there, and the next thing you know, you're just looking around and there's a mess of people. But the grim realization that three veteran firefighters and the three children do not survive sends shockwaves through this tight-knit community. They were never to come up with an initial cause of the fire due to the uh, debris uh, and the rubble uh, from the house. Today, all three survivors continue to fight fires in Gloucester County, but they can often be found visiting a memorial honoring their fallen comrades. I feel truly lucky to be alive and to know that I almost lost my life and that I was rescued and pulled from the three-story house that collapsed. Uh, it just makes you feel very fortunate to be here.